Okay, this little video is just about a few things that can affect the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction. So just a bit of a reminder for you. In an enzyme controlled reaction, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about lock and key or induced fit. This is my enzyme. There's its active site in a specific shape and it is complementary to its substrate. And you're then going to be left with, because the enzyme is unchanged, you're going to be left with your enzyme and then your product, whatever that is. And it might be a breakdown thing and it might be a building up thing, it doesn't really matter which. Obviously, before the two things are locked together in that enzyme substrate complex, first of all, they've got to collide. So it's really about collision theory and rates of collisions and more importantly they've got to collide successfully. So they've got to collide at angles and uh, with each other so that that reaction will happen and the activation energy can be lowered. So things that can affect how that happens. We've got I suppose the easiest one, the one that everybody always starts with, is temperature. Remembering that we don't actually abbreviate that to temp, which is a temporary person in an office. Um, and we're going to do a rate of reaction. Now obviously you can't measure a rate of reaction directly. So this might be uh, something like um, the mass of product. Per minute. So you measure how much product's made in a minute. It might be the volume if it's a gas. Um, it might be the time taken for something to happen and then you do one over the time to get the rate. So rate can't be measured directly. You have to do something else. And if we were measuring any of those things and then converting or assuming a, a rate, what we would see is that as temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction, and then suddenly it drops off really quite rapidly. So this is not an evenly shaped bell-shaped curve. It's, um, it's a curve that sort of starts looking as though, oh yes, we're going to go off into the stratosphere, and then suddenly goes, oh no, hang on a minute. So, what's going on here? What's causing this? Well, first of all, as we increase temperature, the molecules gain kinetic energy. Now, it's quite often that I read in a student's work that it says, as temperature increases, so does the kinetic energy as though kinetic energy was some kind of entity in, its, in itself and as temperature increased suddenly then you'd get more of it from who knows where. But it's not, it's the molecules actually picking up that the transference of energy uh, from whatever is causing the warmer temperature um, to the molecules. So the molecules are gaining kinetic energy and they are moving faster. So back to our, our collisions, if they're moving faster they are more likely to collide and because the shape of the active site is complementary to that of the substrate they will collide successfully enough to cause that reaction to happen. So that's all about sort of increased rate of movement between the two, more successful collisions and therefore uh, more products made, faster rate of reaction. This point at the top, the very peak of the graph, is called the optimum. Now for humans, um, and for human pathogens, the optimum is around about body temperature of 37 degrees, but it isn't always that way. So there are thermophiles, uh, organisms that live in hot springs, for example, where the optimum is going to be higher. 
there are ones that live in places that are cold that are going to have lower optimums than that and it's only really for sort of humans and mammals um, and things that live in us that have these optima of around about 37 degrees. So what's causing this decrease in reaction after that optimum temperature is the distortion of the active site. So if you can imagine that instead of being this perfectly uh, shaped Pac-Man mouth shape, some of the bonds perhaps holding this upper lip into shape had been distorted, it might still collide but it won't be as successful and that will slow it down a bit. And if it's slowed down a bit, obviously the rate has gone down. Eventually, and that sort of, that successful collisions go down, 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 down until the enzyme is completely denatured. So obviously here it's, you know, it's still working as well as it was at that temperature there. So you wouldn't say that enzyme's not working. It is working. Um, it's just not working at its very best. And that sometimes can be useful in a cell, so sometimes having a sub-optimal temperature or a temperature that's slightly higher than the optimum can slow things down, which sometimes is an advantage. What you wouldn't want to happen is that it goes all the way to zero. Now at that point, we describe the enzyme as being denatured. Now what that means is that the hydrogen bonds uh, particularly, they're the very weakest. Uh, perhaps the ionic interactions um, not very likely to be a covalent bond like a peptide or a disulfide bond. Perhaps some of these hydrophobic ones have been disrupted and they have altered therefore the shape of the active site. It's this active site shape that's important. So if you start messing about with the bonds in the tertiary structure of the protein, then the active site shape will change. There'll be less successful collisions. When you've fully denatured, there'll be no successful collisions. It might be that the substrate doesn't fit in anymore. Um, so that would be fully denatured. And remember not to say killed. You you really won't get anything for saying killed. It has to be denatured. You should explain about bonds breaking. Um, you should explain about the active site changing shape and say less successful collisions. Or if you're talking about full denaturation, no successful collisions. Uh, okay, that wraps up for temperature. I'm going to leave it there and do a different one on pH.